This is the Used Car Dealer Podcast. Well, hello here. It's Zach and another episode of the Used Car Dealer Podcast. And we have a really timely guest, David Fouts, who is the VP of sales at Cox Automotive. And he oversees some of their largest brands, including Dealer Track, KBB, and X Time. Thank you for joining the podcast today, David. Zach, pleasure to be with you. Thanks for having me. So let's get started. For those of us listening and wondering what your role at Cox Encompass is, tell us a little bit about that and how you got into the car business. Yeah, so right out of college, I started selling a dealer management system uh, at first to motorcycle dealers, but it wasn't long before I shifted to a business that was focused on the automotive industry. Moved out here to uh, Cleveland, Ohio, where I've been since 2001. And my whole career has been involved with software development for dealers, uh, sales, marketing, product management, um, and OEMs. And um, I've spent time uh, in the fixed ops systems. And uh, since joining Cox three and a half years ago, been involved a little more with the front end uh, with some of our um, Kelly Blue Book, the Auto, VIN, and, and other solutions. Nice. And let's talk about the COVID-19 pandemic. It's definitely top of mind for a lot of dealers. And I'd like to hear your observations this year in the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of both the fixed stop side of the business as well as the retail side of the business. What a ride. It, you know, we have a, a roller coaster park out here in Ohio, Cedar Point. And, you know, depending on which graph you're looking at, this is either a big dip down followed by an up or a big up followed by a down. Um, I love a quote from Henry Ford um, where, where he said, don't find fault, find a remedy. And I, you know, I think that's good advice. And it's advice dealers show all the time. You know, you and I can't necessarily influence the macroeconomic condition, but we can figure out how to operate most efficiently, regardless of what's going on around us. And dealers are doing it. But what have we seen? Let's, you know, let's talk about falling margins. You know, margin compression has been a trend since the end of World War II. And yeah. somehow, miraculously, in the last couple of months, it's like we've rolled back the clock where inventories have been down, prices have been up, and profitability you know, has been improving. And it shifted from who has the most competitive price online to who can be most effective at you know, their inventory management, you know, who has the car that that um, consumer wants. So MMR is a tool, I think, or, or a measurement most dealers are very familiar with from Mannheim. We saw MMR daily retention go from 100% in, in February down to 90%, um, you know, through April and back up to 105%. And now it's back right at 100%. So prices are starting to normalize. Um, if we look at, at vehicle prices, um, just a snapshot from the middle of October, year over year, right. uh, you're looking at, you know, prices of vehicles are up. So uh, in total, 16% year over year. Uh, and it just kind of depends from, you know, mo mid-sized cars have the lowest at 6.1% increase and pickups are 27.9% more expensive this year than last year when you're just comparing prices. Um, on the other hand, we, you know, there's the inventory picture. So, um, sales were up at 160% year over year, um, dropped to 40% in April, spiked back up to 120% in June. But the message here and the data that we're seeing is things are normalizing October and what we predict for November sales will be right around 100% year over year. Huh. Um, and then of course, the other side of that is inventories, day supply, what a ride, you know, we were at 40, an average of 45 day supply for the average dealership, used car dealership across the country in wow. January. That spiked up to over 100 days in April. 
and then dropped, you know, we were seeing it as low as 20, 20 days supply. Wow. But then the, the news here is inventory's back. Inventories have been growing. The average dealer's right around 48, 50 days supply again. So the bubble is ending, or at least the data would suggest that, you know, these good times are not going to last forever. Right. So you mentioned margin compression and, you know, the fact that used car volume and pricing has been very strong, especially this summer, why should dealers not take their eye off the ball in fighting margin compression? That's, that's, that, that's the question that we would really recommend every dealer to consider. Don't take your eye off the ball. Why? Because this isn't, this isn't a permanent change to a 40 year trend. It's a moment in time and we can all recognize some of the external influencers that changed the economics. Those won't last. So margin compression will be back. Prices are coming, you know, back down. Um, while vehicle prices are up, wholesale prices were up too. The cost of acquiring the vehicles went up. So margins didn't grow as much as prices did. And again, as inventory um, rehydrates, um, price competition will increase. We're going to be right back to where we were last year, we think, fairly quickly. So don't take your eye off the ball for your costs and for the long term. I would suggest, as you're looking at metrics, for example, to really focus on year over year mm. rather than month over month because we're going through such a dynamic time. Smart. And when you look at dealerships, especially used car dealerships, and their, um, let's call it, speeded up adoption of technology during the pandemic, give me some of your insight kind of from the DMS or the X time kind of the service front, what you've observed in terms of quicker adoption of technology by dealers in the pandemic. Thanks, Zach. So, um, let, let, let me, uh, let me approach it this way. Um, customer expectations have accelerated. I think the behavior we're seeing, it, it didn't come out of nowhere. It's just that consumers expect it more. And in some ways, I think it's this function of you can't unsee something. You know, once yeah. you've used your app to place a, an order at Walmart and you've shown up in the parking lot and they walked it out to you, you know, you, you know that that kind of convenience is possible. Like, why would I ever go into that store ever again? You know, right. um, the same thing's going on. So let's talk about service. Consumers wanted um, to fix their vehicle in more convenient ways. They're influenced by their experiences online with Amazon or others. Um, during the pandemic, service pickup and delivery services um, really spiked. So 69% of consumers say once they had that experience, 69% say that's the thing that will drive their decision about where they get their, their vehicle serviced again. Uh, we saw on the franchise dealer front, uh, over 80% of dealerships offering pickup and delivery. So I don't have to take my car to you. You pick it up from me in my, in my uh, driveway and you drop it back off when it's fixed. Um, so adopting the tools to make that a reality and something that can be offered um, is, is really important. Um, an insight here for services, it's not just a cost. It's not just a new cost to a dealership to, to add that technology or, or that offer. Uh, the large majority of consumers would pay $20 for the convenience, an additional $20. But more importantly, dealerships that are combining video and texting with a pickup and delivery service. So while they have my car, mm -hmm. taking a quick video that shows the technician, shows my car on the lift, shows the broken components and describes why they're recommending a service. And then they're texting me that quote, which I can then approve. Those two things with pickup and delivery are driving $200 increase in average repair orders. Wow. Um, so, with a consumer expectation, there is also a new opportunity to make more revenue. Uh, digital retailing, similar um, 
transition, I mean, dramatic transition for how many dealerships are extending beyond their physical store limitations. So 88% of used car dealers tell us they have something in place to connect and do business beyond their physical location. And 65% of independents say they are actively implementing a digital retailing system for their business. Um, on the consumer side, 73% increase in those interested in transacting and, and finalizing a deal online. And two out of three consumers state that they strongly prefer, you know, digital retailer or, you know, we call it DR as yeah. a way to buy a car. Uh, so that, that's not going away. That, uh, that preference is here to stay. And, and it's not just generational. It's not just the younger buyers. It's everyone across the board stating a preference for digital retailing. So discuss some of the process improvements that you've seen the most successful independent dealers take on during the pandemic. Thank you. So for digital retailing, um, it is about, of course, all of the merchandising that's already been going on with presenting vehicles, walk around videos, high quality photos, and all of the basics that we've been talking about for years. But then adding to that, the ability to present a, an actual payment estimate or a pretty accurate payment estimate to a consumer and a digital retailing process that ties into lending. The other two keys that I would suggest is don't forget the trade-in. A lot of dealerships have neglected that side of the discussion or aren't equipped to do that digitally. Kelly Blue Book has some great tools that can help a consumer get that third-party valuation on their trade-in. We can, we can guarantee an instant cash offer for the value so that those adjustments, once you see the vehicle in person, if needed, are, are understood and easy to manage. And then the third thing I would say, or, or trap that we've observed is, don't forget for those that have service operations, mm -hmm. get the sales to service handoff. When someone's sitting in the chair in sales, it's pretty straightforward to walk them over and introduce them to someone in service. You have to remember to create that same handoff online and you can do it with digital tools like, you know, X time where uh, as part of that process, a seller, remote seller with a remote buyer can connect them to their service scheduling tool mm -hmm. and that first service appointment so that that transition continues. So those are some of the keys I would say, you know, don't forget the financing and actual have a system that connects with lenders. Don't forget the trade-in. As long as everyone has a car they need to get rid of in order to buy a new car. And, and don't forget the sales to service handoff. So at Selly, we've observed more and more dealers get inbound KBB leads to actually buy a customer's vehicle. And a lot of them, they're not even selling a new vehicle to that customer. What have you observed in, ser in terms of like, buying trade-ins from retail dealerships through the KBB arm of Cox? It's, it's really working. The consumers are having a good experience. It works best when dealerships really recognize the difference between a Kelly Blue Book instant cash offer and a typical sales lead. Mm -hmm. So the engagement with that consumer recognizes this is different. It's not I understand you want to buy my Ford F-150 as your opening statement. It's, <laughs> I understand that you have this Chevy to sell and I'm interested in it. Now, often that leads to the second conversation, which is, I'd like to sell you my Ford F-150. But starting it in the right way and treating those customers as sellers uh, primarily is, is a key to success. Um, but dealerships, Used dealerships that are utilizing Kelly Blue Book tools are buying cars at a lower rate than, than you know, lower cost than they can get through auctions or through other processes. They're extending those practices, um, you know, to their direct integration uh, interactions online uh, or on their own website. Mm -hmm. 
And yeah, that, that, that third party of Kelly Blue Book, that trust in that brand and those values is a conversation um, for both parties. And so, yeah, definitely a strategy of acquiring precious used vehicle inventory by with Kelly Blue Book is working for a lot of dealers. So you mentioned digital retail earlier, and a lot of dealers have a different idea of what digital retail might be. Maybe it's to some like an e-commerce checkout widget on your website. For others, it might be like an integrated credit app. How do you define digital retail from the dealer standpoint? Well, it, it is all over the board. Uh, if you ask a dealer, do you do digital retailing? Most say yes. When you look at it, you know, of course, what they're actually doing can, can vary widely. At Cox, we, we really look at it through the consumer lens. And, and when you do that, and when you listen to car buyers, what they want is a true end-to-end -end digital experience. Um, now, there's variations across, across the board. And so the handoffs between I'm interacting with you online and I'm interacting you on a phone with you in a phone call, sometimes coming into the dealership, obviously for a test drive, but mm -hmm. the transitions between online and in-store or virtual and more direct communication like we're having today, those are the keys to look at for great processes so that those handoffs are smooth. It's frustrating to a consumer, you know, when they're actually now talking to one of your sales reps to have to repeat themselves yep. or that they don't know all the information I filled into your form online or that we're starting over with a, a credit discussion when I thought I already submitted information to get approved. And those are the most frustrating moments, those disconnects. And so, um, you know, the right processes have to take it end to end, not because every consumer will go from A to Z, but because you need the flexibility. They might go from A to D online, jump, jump in your store for E through F, then back online for the rest, you know, if, if that makes sense, Zach. Makes perfect sense. And I wanted to ask you about some of the future. So what's your opinion on EV vehicles and the sort of changes fix ops will have in terms of personnel, tools, facilities, because it's not like a traditional gas, you know, vehicle like oil change, for instance, that wouldn't exist in an EV vehicle. So what are your thoughts on EVs as it relates to fixed ops? Yeah, so electric vehicles um, has been something we've been looking at and talking about for 10 years plus. Um, adoption it seems like at every step of this conversation has been slower than perhaps people expected. And that continues today. Um, although there's a lot of, you know, press about Tesla, when you, when you look at the, the actual vehicles in operation and the percent that ve electric vehicles represent and are likely to represent, mm -hmm. even with strong growth, this is gonna be a slow impact to fixed operations. Um, Cox is really interested in electric vehicles and in helping our partners stay in front. Uh, you know, for example, running Mannheim, we have a common use case where there's battery problems, you know, on the vehicle with the vehicle that's at the, at the auction. Wow. And so we've had to develop, you know, systems and processes and equipment to quickly recharge and address battery issues because you can't drive it through the lane at all you know, if the battery's dead. Um, so there's technologies that will continue to improve and um, the battery's a big issue obviously on the on electric vehicles. And you know, I think I think the challenges or opportunities with fixing the, the car or truck itself will be very manageable. My advice to dealerships as they look forward is really less, you know, I would say worry less about electric vehicle impact and worry more about your consumer expectations and interacting with them in a way that they prefer. Um, you've, you've got to take a digital retailing experience to your service department 
as well as your sales department to retain customers going forward. That, that will be more important and more impactful to your business. So give me a peek ahead at 2021 and what are some of the key trends to protect profitability at the dealership? So let's maybe let me unpack that in, in two in two parts, if that's okay. Sure. Zach. So, so you know, how do you protect profitability? I, I would say first you, you have to stay focused on the data. So times have been not normal. Don't take your eye off the ball. Um, so what does that mean? Your, your dealer management system, your solutions have insights. The, the best kinds of solutions give you good dashboards. Make sure that you're having the practices to look at those leading indicators and to pay attention to your costs and continue to manage your business carefully. Um, so another issue with systems and focusing on data is you know at, at Cox we provide a person with the with the tool we provide a performance manager who is an expert and who is like a personal trainer that shows up every three to four weeks with insights with questions mm -hmm. and with accountability to help you improve your business and work on your business so make sure that you continue to recognize those opportunities to improve margins and manage costs Secondly, along that same lines, it is still about driving efficiency. So the average used car dealer is, is paying $32 per day per vehicle of carrying costs. Mm. So we've got to keep our eye on that. And it, and it leads to natural questions. How is your reconditioning process? How many days is it taking you to turn an acquisition of a vehicle into this vehicle is presented online, ready to sell, um, continue to work on taking hours, if not days out of that process. And then secondly, as you think about driving efficiencies throughout the business, I would say look at duplicate efforts and eliminate them. So one of the things I used to do, I, I used to do some dealership consulting is walk around the dealership and watch for people writing things down on paper. But anytime I saw someone taking a pen and writing something down, it was a signal that there was inefficiency with that system or that process. And we really need to eliminate double entry. You know, right. the right systems will be open and will partner with various software vendors and, and solution providers to eliminate double entry. Um, Dealer track has been a leader in this space decades ago, creating open track and was really a voice in the wilderness at the time in the automotive industry saying, hey, dealer management systems should be open and we should not be paying exorbitant fees to integrate you know, a to a dealer's own data. OpenTrack has been tremendously successful. There's over 140 solution providers that integrate to that open platform. And I, I just think that's really key. You need the flexibility to pick the best solution for your dealership without double entry, without those critical time wasters that, you know, not only cost you money and time, but also frustrate your, your employees. Um, and that really is sort of the third thing about staffing, Zach, uh, that I think is key when it comes to preparing for the future and keeping our eye on, on efficiencies. 66% of used car dealers have told us that they're staffing a dedicated digital retailing team now. And that, that's a shift. In general, dealerships need to be attracting and hiring you know, digital natives to work in the, in the business. And um, you know, speaking from experience, bad systems frustrate great employees and they, they frustrate them quickly because there's so much, you know, Muda, as the Japanese call it, or wasted effort that's not bad at adding any value. So that's sort of on the it, how do you drive efficiency side of you know my perspective. What's coming next? You know, there's so much, but here and the headline is AI. You know, AI is here and it's only going to keep expanding. And I think it's so exciting and helpful for dealerships and consumers. Um, 
none of us like to have wasted conversations. You know, if I'm not actually looking to buy a car, I don't really want to be talking to salespeople. And, and I know as a salesperson, I don't like talking to people that aren't really ready to buy. So there are some just tremendous insights. For example, at Vin Solutions uh, with the AI uh, system that we've launched this year, you know, the experience gets to be better for both the seller and the buyer. Um, we're able to provide insights about how likely they are or how progressed they are in their buying cycle, insights about loyalty to brand, insights about their price range based on their actual behaviors online, oh my and God. preferences, you know, whether it's color or make or brand, and then how strong we think the insight is because we may have a light confidence level or a high confidence level depending on the situation. And how that plays out for a dealership, if they've been in to buy a car from you three years ago and now they start shopping again, you're getting that insight fired up. You know, it's not a lead that you paid for per se, it's insight coming that says, hey, Zach is shopping again. Three years ago, he bought his car from you. Now might be a good time to reach out and say hello. So one example of how AI is exciting and really driving um, efficiencies and growth for dealerships. Awesome. And was there anything else that I didn't mention today that you'd like to discuss or any other futures you're excited about? That is a, a huge question. I, you know, I think, I think we talked about some great things already, Zach. It's, um, you know, I guess to summarize my perspective on, on the topics, um, COVID has been crazy. It's been super challenging um, and different, probably very different than we expected in March. Um, but it's not a permanent state. You know, the, the economic conditions look to be returning more towards year over year normalcy. Uh, if that's even something we can say. But the consumer experiences are going to continue to influence preferences of our buyers, whether it's for service or sales. And dealerships need to, now's the time, now's a great time to invest in systems, inv look at your processes. How can you consistently deliver the experience you want and, and fill the holes? If your digital retailing system is not covering the trade-in question, it's not able to actually consummate the deal online with digital signatures and financing, there's solutions out there for you. So evaluate them and be serious about putting them in place, not only to attract those new customers that you'll miss in the future when that's a hard requirement, but also to drive efficiencies to help your staff be more excited to work there as well. So, you know, technology is a, is a very sound answer when it's done right. And uh, now's the time to investigate and challenge and, and select the right vendors to support your business. I couldn't agree more with you, David, and really appreciate you coming on the show today. You've had some fantastic insight. Thank you. It was great to meet you, Zach, and I look forward to talking more in the future.